We are talking about families that have lost uh, basically everything. Post-revolution, Ukraine is still fighting for its freedom. And Eastern Europe is put on edge by a change in American leadership. It all started here three years ago, in Independence Square, in the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. Hundreds of thousands of people poured into this square and the streets protesting government corruption and a president they felt represented the interests of Russia rather than the will of the people. At issue, should Ukraine have closer ties to the U.S. and Europe or Putin's Russia? It was these guys that were standing up for free credit. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep from tears when you're recalling this. Alia Chandra was in the middle of it. That day, I mean, with the attack of the barricade, there was a huge fire and it was all burnt out. It was quite an apocalyptic scene. We're here now. What do you think? What's going through your mind? Do you think it was, it was worth it? Um, well, definitely it was worth it because otherwise, uh, if we had not overthrown this authoritarian leader, we don't know what would have happened next. Would uh, Ukraine be a dictatorship? I feel a deep sense of responsibility to implement that dream for which people stood up for. That dream, what is that dream? Um, it's a democratic Ukraine, free from want or corruption, where people of all ethnic backgrounds have a goal to have a chance to live, fulfill their dreams and to live a decent life. It's basically, speaking shortly, it's Ukraine where people, to which people would want to emigrate to, not emigrate from. Realizing that dream is a struggle. Ukraine is fighting an unrelenting war with Russian-backed separatists in the east. Corruption is still rampant, and people are frustrated at the state of the economy and that reforms aren't happening fast enough. And now, a new worry. The uncertainty of working with new American leadership that has put Eastern Europe on edge. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson reportedly said to a group of top diplomats, why should U.S. taxpayers be interested in Ukraine? In Ukraine, we are very puzzled because there have been contradictory statements coming from the Trump administration. Um, on the one hand, the strong statement of a U.S. ambassador to the um, UNSC. Until Russia and the separatists it supports respect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, this crisis will continue. Um, on the other hand, Trump questioning Russian influence in the Donbass elections. This is all very puzzling for us and frankly nobody knows what will happen. But of course losing the U.S. support in, um, in combating Russian aggression and uh, completing the democratic transformation, it, it would be catastrophic for Ukraine. Even as the U.S. and Russian governments have clashed over Syria, President Trump and his cabinet have shown little interest in standing up for Ukraine. And Trump has hinted at lifting economic sanctions meant to push back at Russia's annexation of Crimea and its aggression in eastern Ukraine. Here, those sanctions are seen as hugely important, perhaps one of the only things deterring Russian aggression. Natalia Kasherbushkovska, a member of Ukraine's parliament, says sanctions have worked. And if they were lifted? It would be a very bad signal uh, to Ukraine uh, and, uh, well, uh, what Kayana say. So we will be do everything possible uh, to negotiate that sanctions should be uh, well, stay at the same level at least. And while sanctions may have helped deter Russia from advancing militarily, Ukraine faces all kinds of intimidations from its neighbor. I would say that energy is also a tool uh, to blackmail Ukraine, to destabilize Ukraine. They decide to uh, bypass Ukrainian pipelines. So they use this uh, means just in, uh, to destabilize, to make Ukraine weaker, uh, as well as uh, some, there was some cyber attacks on our power plants. Uh, there was a lot of informational propaganda. So uh, this is 
combination of tools to make Ukraine weaker and to destabilize our, uh, our country and our um, society. And there's another front in this conflict, a propaganda war. When Russia annexed Crimea, Ukrainian academics created Stop Fake to combat an influx of disinformation targeting Ukraine. We already accumulated more than 1,000 stories on our website, so if at the beginning we were not sure about how it's organized, if this is kind of organized propaganda or just a bad journalism, so at this point we are absolutely definite that this is a very well-organized system and we are absolutely sure that it comes from Russia because we monitor Russian media. In 10 different languages, the fact-checking site partners with journalists in several countries to debunk Russian disinformation. They've observed the fake news problem spread far beyond the borders of Ukraine. With the U.S. elections, we see more and more how the problem of fake news and disinformation is kind of spreading around. And on one hand, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, interesting to look at this from a comparative perspective and to look what worked in Ukraine and what worked in the U.S. and what didn't. It's both mainstream media and then those media which were considered to be the fringes and then social media with a huge influx of bots, trolls and uh, all other other kind of a newer phenomena connected to the social media. Uh, so it was kind of a combination of all these channels. This February marks the two-year anniversary of something called Minsk II. It's an agreement signed by all sides that was supposed to stop the fighting. But the recent surge in violence shows it's not over. Government forces and separatists are fighting once again. This war has claimed nearly 10,000 lives since it began in 2014. The most recent uptick in violence was in the frontline town of Advienka. Over 30 people reported dead in the fighting that escalated shortly after a phone call between Trump and Putin. Within 24 hours of you on the phone with the Russian leader, the pro-Russian forces step up the violence in Ukraine. Yeah. Did you take that as an insult? No, I didn't because we don't really know exactly what that is. Uh, they're pro forces. We don't know are they uncontrollable? Are they uncontrolled? That happens also. We're going to find out. I would be surprised, but we'll see. For most Ukrainians and Western governments monitoring the conflict, this is not a question. Russia has been fueling the war in eastern Ukraine with soldiers and weapons. The impact for civilians has been devastating. We are talking about families that have lost uh, uh, basically everything, uh, properties, uh, income, uh, in some cases social benefits, children that have, uh, you know, ha are not going to, uh, you know, to school very often, that have limited access to health care. So it, is, uh, it has been um, a major uh, change and deterioration in the, uh, in the life and the well-being of, uh, of thousands. UNICEF Ukraine representative Giovanna Barberas calls it an invisible emergency, a crisis most of the world has forgotten. We have had also a deterioration and escalation in the, uh, you know, in the conflict this last few weeks, and this, of course, has had an impact on you know, the life of, uh, of many, uh, particularly, especially children, living in, uh, in conflict areas. Unfortunately, uh, the number of children in need of humanitarian assistance has grown, uh, has doubled actually compared to, uh, to last year. We have today, we are estimating around one million children in need of humanitarian assistance. So it is, uh, it is of uh, great concern. To get a closer look at the conflict's impact on young Ukrainians, I took a train to eastern Ukraine, to a region of the country called Donbass, where the war is dragging into its third year. The entrance sign to the city of Slavyansk is riddled with bullet holes, and a nearby neighborhood remains in ruins. The city was a flashpoint in the early stages of the war. Masked and armed men captured several government buildings here in Slavyansk, including this building, which is home to the city council and executive committee. 
They also took over the police department and security services. But Ukrainian forces were able to retake the city in just a few months. The front line is now about an hour away. Despite the nearby war, locals try to carry on as usual. 16-year-old Kate Karchenko and many of her classmates fled Slavyansk when the shelling got intense. We tried to deal with these feelings. We were nervous, we were frightened, um, and uh, mostly unconfident in what will be then, what will be in the future. Even when I moved to um, another city um, in that time, uh, I remember I um, heard these sounds even in, at night. It was like a little bit strange and also scary. The UN estimates over 1.5 million people have become internally displaced as a result of the conflict. Hundreds of thousands of them, children. And here in eastern Ukraine, one out of every five schools has been destroyed or damaged. The situation is especially dire for people living close to either side of the front line. The line divides Ukrainian and separatist-controlled areas. Fighting is most intense here, with frequent ceasefire violations, unpredictable shelling, and landmines. And without steady support from allies, many Ukrainians worry the democratic dream so many died fighting for will be forgotten. What's frightening for me is how much, how many people in the EU and the US don't value these democratic institutions that they have. I mean, in, in Ukraine, um, we are in such a state of a country because we uh, haven't had them and we want to build them anew. I'm hoping that people in the West, they will um, take a moment to reflect on what democracy actually gives them and how much, how many, how many people in Ukraine died for the dream of building this democracy in our country.